I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me in the studio, feeling the Ric Flair drip, it's Andy Greenwald! Thank you for that. That's a nice one. You're the offset to my Quavo. I appreciate that. Are you? Um, in the sense that I am the... Boy, this is a problematic conversation. Less a pre- Yeah, can you scratch that? <laughs> no, we can keep going. Uh, Andy, it's Thursday. It's the re-up. This is the zigging and zagging people love from our podcast. They go straight from a U2 conversation yeah. to ranking the members of Migos. Number one, Offset. Number two, Quavo. Number three, I don't know the other members of Migos. Today, we are going to be talking to likely Academy Award nominee yes. for Best Supporting Actress, Lori Metcalf. She is about to put the third... Link in her EGOT chain. I don't know like how... Like Thanos it, with the Infinity Gems. If you're out there and you guys can plot me the path for Laurie Metcalf getting the Grammy, let mm, me know. Yeah. LMK. Because I'm having a hard time putting it together. No disrespect to Laurie Metcalf. She visited us from the set of Roseanne. She came down... That was so cool. ...from where she was shooting yeah. the Ro- Ro- Roseanne reboot on Netflix. Uh, what a wonderful lady. What yep. a, just a, like a like a class act, and also just like you were in the presence of a real artist. We really enjoyed talking to her. So we're going to talk to her today. Obviously, I think Lady Bird is probably our consensus movie of the year. She is yeah. remarkable mm-hmm. in Lady Bird, mm-hmm. and if you haven't seen it yet, go see it. Go go! Don't do anything. Forget Star Wars. Really, you want to no, tell people no, to forget Star Wars? No, I, I can't. I can't help people forget Star Wars. Speaking of Star Wars, let's talk about the Star Wars parent company really quickly. Okay, because the Disney, the Walt Disney Corporation, mm-hmm. uh, is in talks, re- reportedly in talks, to buy some of, basically, buy 21st Century Fox. Mm-hmm. They're going to buy the movie studio, the movie properties, and the television properties of Fox. Yeah, and uh, it's worth mentioning that doesn't sound like they're going to buy Fox News, um, but. This is a big deal. This is a big deal, not only in terms of a wider industry story about uh, consolidation yeah. and mergers, and you know, obviously, there is the very contentious AT and T Time Warner merger that still is yet to play out, and there's lawsuits flying on that one. This one uh, is in talks, though, and obviously, for our within our the the for our purview, the the biggest thing would be the new assets under Disney control. I just want to say that if your reaction to this news of major media consolidation Uh is plus or minus squee Wolverine gets to be in the Avengers now, Uh delete your account. (laughs) And by your account, I mean your life. All right. Because... Let's go, Chomsky. That's what I'm saying. Like, look, (laughs) I love a good team up as as much as the next chap. But I don't see how this is good, you know? And I do think that the... The the way that we now can you don't see how this is good for the industry or for the, for the wor- X-Men for the world. OK, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were concerned you're like Logan died in I mean, X-Men if we, continuity. I'm not doing Chapo tra- Trap House. So like if you want to talk about like whether people are going to get laid off, that's that. Is that what we're talking about? That's what this podcast is about. Layoffs. <laughs> this is a labor based podcast. Layoff is my third no, favorite I, Migos I, member. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I honestly think that like one of the things that's strange about the well now Disney can fix X Men mm-hmm. is I don't even know if you can you, you I think that there needs to be a break uh, f- for that that whole franchise. Yes, they need to do like a hard reset for all of it. But but you know, is for as much as Fox has for a lot of its ownership of the X Men not been the most able stewards mm-hmm. of it in the last two or three years they've become. Much more creative right, because, because they're out doing of necessity. Ones, yeah. And they're just basically saying, well, we can't compete. So we're going to make Logan. We're going to make Legion. We're going to make New Mutants. Yep. And we're, and we're going to make Deadpool. And we're just going to throw stuff against the wall. And hopefully it's fun. And hopefully people enjoy it. And we're not going to worry about the big picture stuff. And that's actually been kind of rewarding. Um, we wanted to get to Laurie Metcalf. But before we do, there's two new, sh- not new shows, but there are two shows that you and I have been w- watching da- separately. Da- dabbling. Dabbling in, and uh, you know they—they they actually is this going to become a thing where we just surprise each other all the time? Well, you because, go first because I know that I want to hear. I want to hear about Dark that's on Netflix because you you were checking that out. A lot of people are asking us to watch it. I was I was just just wading through my menchies. Well, they the have. Other day. I think they have a pretty strong street team. This is me. Yeah. Well, but you know, surprise, surprise. Um, it, the show's in German. Did you know that? I, I didn't. So the street team is. <laughs> I, I can't actually understand what they're saying. There are a lot of like compound words yeah. and things that are, all the nouns are capitalized. This is a really interesting show, and I basically wanted to bring it up, not because we're going to spoil it in any way, but I think that people who listen to our podcast and watch other shows we recommend might enjoy it. And 
we there's some time to check it out over the holidays, and maybe we'll come back and, and get back into it a little bit in January. This is Netflix's first uh, German language original show. They are obviously expanding rapaciously around the globe and developing original properties in every country. But you have to think that part of their strategy is to make things in the native language of each country that mm-hmm. potentially could cross over. And Dark is so easily um, pitched. Mm-hmm. Do you, you remember, maybe our listeners do too, there was a French show, um, the translation was The Returned, um, a, a couple years ago. Great Mogwai soundtrack for that, that Great show? soundtrack from Mogwai. Yeah. It is The Return meets Stranger Things. Okay. It is, if Stranger Things was not a um, medium budget PG-13 1984 adventure, but a, a light R art house film nice. from like 1988 or 1989, uh, it is set in a town in... Um, in the not the wilderness, but sort of a country town. The in Black the Forest. It, it, you know, I couldn't really catch. It really the, pops off there. I couldn't really catch the color of the forest, but it, it is heavily <laughs> it's wooded. The name of the forest, not it's, the color. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, look, I, I, again, I, I've never. I, maybe I'm as worldly as Can you. Imagine if you just like walked up to a forest. You're like, this is black AF. <laughs> yeah, this is dark. Yeah. Is that your Fodor's entry <laughs> <Yeah>. for Germany? <laughs> you're in the wrong field, my man. Um, and there's a nuclear power plant, and some stuff has happened in the past, and it seems to be happening again. And of course, there's some there's a bunch of kids. Uh, it's about uh, time travel, mm-hmm. which is always an easy sell. But it's so far it's done in a very brooding but compelling way. So far that I've seen it, it's a little bit unsettling in in really good ways. And it's really interesting more than anything else to see how certain tropes are easily exportable. I mean, there's no question that Stranger Things probably does well for Netflix globally, but actually kind of inspiring because. If it's if it's Germany's Stranger Things, okay. So tell me more about your demons, Germany. Sure. You know <laughs> what 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 is interesting about this to you? And right up off the bat, there's something that I appreciate so much in comparison to Stranger Things season two, which is that the kids at the center of this, at the beginning of it, um, have ex- at least one of them has experienced massive loss. Mm-hmm. And that pitches the whole show a little bit differently because the beginning of Stranger Things, and maybe this speaks to the American character or the nostalgia from 1984, they're just kids. And it's really about being forced to grow up slash adolescence. And it and it exists in a kind of, I think we talked about this when we talked about Stranger Things, like a, a, a national innocence mm-hmm. that was maybe breaking a little bit as the Cold War came to an end in our culture, if not in our lives. I appreciate that in this show, these kids have already... This, They've the, already gone through it. Some stuff's already like life isn't easy. Right. Like life isn't just playing dig dug in a way that I appreciate. Um, not that life's particularly hard. It looks quite nice in wind in Germany <laughs> when there aren't <laughs> demons emerging from time travel caves. But it's it's cool, and I, I appreciate people shouting shouting it out because I, I wasn't aware. One one note, it's super dubbed, and you can change it to the original German and put um, subtitles on yeah. it. Yeah. One further note about that, I had it on the German. I switched it to the German, and then I was like, there's a voiceover in the German. Let's switch it back. And there's not voiceover in the English. And I was like, what are they oh, hiding? Interesting. Germany, what are you hiding from me? <laughs> so I, I ran it back again. Uh-huh. Voice so you over. watched this one episode three Just times this one scene. Three different languages. This, this one scene in the okay. beginning. And I was like, run it back. Again, no voiceover in English. So I put it back. Okay, the German voiceover guy's there. And I, I'll be honest with you, my German's a little rusty. But clearly, at one point, the guy's saying, this man is un Polistoffen or whatever. Yeah. He's like, he's the policeman. I'm like, why, why is he, why is he ex- explaining it to me? And then I realized that there is an option for, I assume, um, visually impaired people where a German man tells you how what you're How did your seeing. settings get to that point in the it's first an, place? Uh, it's an option. Was so that you, how you watched Ozark? <laughs> so they're like, this man is a money launderer. The corpse has fallen at his feet. He looks distraught. Really? Can you imagine that gig? Yeah, that would be pretty. I mean, look, I'm I'm available. But like, what would your life be if instead of the Ron Howard? Can you imagine arrested, though if wait, you and I got to do it for Ozark and be like, "Yo, this guy <laughs> just got tossed off a balcony and that's, now Marty bought a strip club." <laughs> that's what our life is like. That's yes. what this podcast is. I'm saying instead of the, I feel like many of us in 2017 walk around with a Ron Howard Arrested Development narrator <laughs> in, his, in our heads, going like. Guess what? He didn't. Yeah. But what if that voice Actually, was... I think it's more like a uh, Cormac McCarthy Blood Meridian voice. Fair. Where just like see the child. What if it was Werner Herzog <laughs> like it was on my view first viewing of Dark? Um, it sounds like part of the charm of this was the degree to which it wound up in your life in an unexpected, yes, exactly. you know, and that we weren't bludgeoned over the head with get ready, promo, like spoiler laden tweets. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, that's sort of the excitement I have for Channel Zero. 
So mm-hmm. Channel Zero is a horror anthology that is on sci-fi. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's in its se- it just finished, I think, its second season, and each season is like its own its own story. So the, uh, this this season, oh, so each it's not Black Mirror. Each episode isn't its own story. Each this episode season. is like it's a each season is its own story. So it's, it's so it's like a American Horror Story. Yes, not closer Black to that. Um, and it seems to draw largely from almost kind of like an urban legend sort of thing. So this season yeah. is called No End House, and it's based on a creepypasta. Do you know what creepypastas are? Is, is that what you call gluten-free spaghetti <laughs> That's in right. your household? That's the pasta they sell at Bill's house. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it's this online story database where people post like scary stories and pictures like Slender Man. And I don't know if you remember the, um, the story that Victor Luckerson wrote earlier in the year about the Zelda thing it was like the majora something or other i can't remember the name of legend of zelda yeah but it was like a part of the world of zelda that somebody like just are you got are you pitching with. me nintendo fanfic right now on this no podcast? but it's not nintendo fanfic it's like it's like ghost stories basically okay so, so you know i'm not gonna be looking at there this. was a creepypasta story called no end house the, they adapted it they changed it the setup that i will say okay uh is and it, it's written by uh nick antosca who wrote for hannibal mm-hmm. and um the setup is basically a bunch of teenagers are home from college for their first summer. A few of them are. They're, they're all hanging out. At like this, when we met. Right. And they're all hanging out in the suburbs, and they don't really have anything to do. So far, this really is our life. Keep going. And they hear about a pop-up escape room installation, <laughs> and they go to it. Uh, they, they get a very creepy advertisement It's veered for away it. from our experience. Yes. And they show up in the suburbs, and they show up at this place in the suburbs, and it's a house painted black. Mm. And there are people like stumbling out of it, mm-hmm. looking very distressed. Did they just watch the pilot of Ozark? <laughs> <laughs> just like on a loop? They just heard Ric Flair drip for the first time. That's right. And uh, they're really like, they're sick. They're like shaken up. Yeah. And um, there's a sign outside the house that says, The No End House, Unknown Artist, Caulk, Wood, Metal, You. Those are the the things the material oh, the, oh, oh oh as if you're in a museum and yes. it's the material a mixed and media i will say that That's the great. first episode of this show it's called this isn't real is the scariest thing i've seen since white bear the, the black, black mirror, mirror episode of white bear so i i don't want to say much more wow. other than the fact that wow. great horror is is somewhat dependent on secrecy yeah i, I sure. remember when i saw the ring i didn't know a lot about it you know mm-hmm. like it was just sort of people would be like you Got to see this from mm-hmm. the movie. And um, I think some of the best horror experiences I've ever had, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I didn't really know what happened in it. And I watched it on like VHS at two in the morning <laughs> in a new apartment that I moved into in Boston. And all the furniture was basically like upside down and scattered. And I don't even know if we had like lamps yet. Yeah. And it was terrifying. <laughs> And this had some of the same vibe because I was, I was just, it was like 1130 and I was like, oh, a couple of people have mentioned this. I yeah. think I'll check it out. And it scared the shit out of me. Like wow. legitimately had bad dreams afterwards and oh, I no. do not scare easily. No, you like this stuff. So Channel Zero, No uh, End House. I think it started in September. So I think it's wrapped up its, it's run. A good recommendation. Did I ever tell you about the time that um, in my capacity as spins like D grade movie reviewer in 2000 or 99 or whatever it was, I went to see a screening of the first uh, Blair Witch Project uh-uh. in like one of those Madison Avenue screening rooms. Did you think that it was a documentary? Everyone <laughs> thought it was a documentary. <laughs> And I wasn't going to like it. Like, I, I liked it, but I wasn't like, I would not have sought out that experience. Of course. And everyone else in there looked like they were auditioning to play the Emily Blunt role in The Devil Wears Prada <laughs> six years too early. <laughs> and then they were literally sobbing around me. Just like mascara Just everywhere. Just mascara yeah. everywhere. And then everyone jumped on their razor scooters and tearfully, you know, foot pedaled their way home through Manhattan. That's good stuff. All right. So, uh, dark. And Channel Zero, No End House. A little bit more... Also, uh, think about the people when you think about the mergers. Yeah, that's the most important thing, right? People over corporations. Yeah. That's that's the message of this podcast. One other thing. Oh, yeah. Um, a bit of house cleaning. Um, we are coming up on the next entry in the Double Down Book Club, Queen Pin by Megan Abbott. A slim you, volume. A slim so volume. No this excuse. Is, this is an easy and fun read. It is going to be uh, a week from today. We're going to talk about it mm-hmm. with Megan joining us um, next Thursday. We'll also be talking about Mindhunter. I will and finally get to talk about the end of Mindhunter. Yeah, so finish Mindhunter and read a book. That's your homework from us. Yeah. Um, in, uh, in more immediate news, on Monday, it's our now, I think we can say our annual year in TV Gab Fest <laughs> with <laughs> FOP 
friend of the pod, Sam Esmail. Yeah. So we'll do our top 10 lists on Monday. Sam will do his. What is Sam going to be most angry at us for this year? Not talking about television. Oh, no. He's already mad at that. Oh. I mean, on our lists. What, uh, what do you think? I think, I think probably my list will piss him off. I will say that in my last communication with him confirming his appearance on the podcast, his his one-line text was, that's fine. I can't believe Chris likes Ozark that much. Well, wait till he hears me talk about billions. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, let's get to our Lori Metcalf interview after a word from our sponsor. We'll be back on Monday with Sam Esmail to go over the year in TV. Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. In need of great talent for your business, but short on time, you don't have to get lost in a huge stack of resumes to find the perfect hire. You just need the right tools, smarter tools. What if hiring could be easier, more streamlined, and less time-consuming? So even when you're busy, you could still be smart about the way you hire. With ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards with just one click. So you can just rest easy knowing your job has been seen by the right candidates. Then, ZipRecruiter puts its smart matching technology to work, actively notifying qualified candidates about your job within minutes of posting, so you receive the best possible matches. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other hiring sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on the right candidates finding you. It finds them. No wonder 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get quality candidates through the site in just one day. And the easy-to-use ZipRecruiter dashboard lets you manage your hiring process from start to finish all in one place. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by growing businesses of all sizes and industries to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, watch listeners can post jobs to ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash watch. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash watch. One more time, ZipRecruiter.com dot com slash watch try it for free today's episode of the watch is brought to you by zell zell is a new way to send money to your friends and family from your banking app cash is easy to lose and checks take a while to clear but with zell once you're enrolled the money moves right between bank accounts and typically arrives in minutes pay your share of the cost of dad's gift request half the cost of the christmas tree you bought with your roommate or pay that personal trainer you hired after thanksgiving with ease all thanks to zell it's so easy to use and works with almost any bank account in the u.s and don't worry zell is safe and backed by major banks which means you can send money confidently just go to zellpay.com to learn more that's z-e-l-l-e-p-a-y.com zell this is how money moves All right, Andy, we are so happy because we're about to be joined by Lori Metcalf, who is one of, I think, probably the great American actresses of her generation. Mm -hmm. You may know her from Roseanne. You may know her from Big Bang Theory, any number of small screen appearances. She's widely regarded as one of the great theater actors working. Yep. Uh, But we're here mostly to talk to her about her role in one of our favorite movies of the year. I hope people have had a chance to see Lady Bird by now. It's it's the rare movie that not only is exceptional when you see it, I love it more in the time that has passed since I saw yeah, it. I can't it's a I can't wait to see it again. We were a little intimidated, I think, to talk to Lori just because she is. First of all, we grew up watching her. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you watching her on Roseanne, me going to the Steppenwolf Theater just as a young boy every weekend, <laughs> sure. just just to bow at the altar of the masters. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a little true West, yeah. <laughs> but but no, but she was terrific to talk to. We had a lot of fun, um, and we were really excited that she could come and join us. And so, if you haven't seen Lady Bird, go see it. This is not the kind of movie you can spoil. Wolverine does not join the Avengers at the end of it. Um, Bummer. I know. It, that's the only thing that could have made it better. All right, let's get to our interview with Laurie Metcalf. Have you seen Lady Bird in theaters? I did. I broke my five-year rule, which okay. was I usually don't see anything that I'm in on film or TV for at least five years so that I don't just watch everything that I did wrong <laughs> okay. and, you know, beat myself up. So that means you're coming up on 2012 stuff now, yeah. huh? <laughs> So yeah. we're, we're about to watch the Goodwin Games. Or, yeah. 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 yeah, right. But I did because I wanted to see it with a live audience. Uh-huh. And I and I wanted to see the r- response that it would have. And I wanted to see the whole rest of the movie that I had no idea <laughs> w- what what happened, all the all the teenage stuff, you know, yeah. that, that, that the family was not a part of. You got to see Timothy I Chalamet, just, man. Yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> I just had to stay in the house and, you know, argue with my daughter. Obviously, it's a character and you're playing the part. But is there an element of maternal uh, – does a maternal instinct take over when you're watching this character making out with the wrong boy in the movie? I mean, do you have these sort of emotional journey – 
from yes. the character's perspective? Well, I, I have to say that I, I don't think my maternal instinct came out in that scene. <laughs> my I flash back on myself, really? you know, in a situation like that. First love, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, which I guess is why a lot of people are responding to the movie because it's – you don't have to be a 17-year-old girl in Sacramento N- no. because – we all were 17 sure. at one point. Th- there's something so timeless about the archetypes she's chosen for yeah. the high school parts. But also we've been experiencing something really fun here where a lot of the the colleagues at the website and the podcast, um, the production are younger. And so a lot of them love the movie because they say, oh, we were in high school in 2002, 2003. Yeah. Yeah. I've got two young kids, so I'm watching it. And I've shifted now. I yes. think they're not going to college, but I'm definitely more on Marion's team than I expected to be when I watched the movie. Uh-huh. This movie probably has – among like the highest approval rating of a piece of pop culture that I've come across since like Hamilton in, in terms of the almost uniform, the almost uniform of like love people have been showing it. Yeah. Did you feel that in the audience when you were watching it? I that, did. Yeah, I did. And it was a surprise to me because really? it, it's just so personal when you're making it yeah. and it's your job. Yeah. And, and you don't know how any, how anything that you do that you put out there is going to be received. So it's just such a rush yeah. when something is received, is so beloved yeah. by audiences. That, to, to have played a, a little part in that is is great. The last 10 minutes of that movie it definitely caused a – everybody in the theater collectively exhales after the last shot. When I, when I saw it in, 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 a, in a screening, it was pretty amazing. The blackout? Yeah. 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 Oh, I, I, was, I was crying too much to notice that. <laughs> yeah. I was, so I'll be honest. <laughs> um, you know, actors often talk about their response to it. They're looking for a great piece of writing. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's the first thing that obviously is going to connect them to a role. What was it about Greta's script? Because I know that there, she doesn't allow for a lot, or at least she says she doesn't allow for a lot of improvisation. On, no, on, there was none. Yeah. What was it about the script itself that jumped well, out the at fact you? that it was that tight, okay. that it didn't need anything to be done. And there, there was no scrambling on the day. You know, oh, we've never solved this. Mm. You know, what would I say? What are we to say? Um, So it was all – and because it's all on the page, you can clearly see, you know, how much thought has been put into it. Um, When I talked to Greta, I I could just tell that she had – she was going to be able to lead me through it in a way that I didn't even see yet. Yeah. Because Mm. of how the script was crafted. You know, a lot of mother-daughter headbutting going on, a lot. But these little moments of heart and and uh, where mother and daughter are on the same page. They're supporting each other. And a little goes a long way. You know, opening presents on a Christmas morning and everybody's finally getting along for mm-hmm. three seconds. Um, so a little bit of that makes it – makes you able to have a lot more of the tense and frustrating scenes where they're each – pushing buttons. Yeah. Uh, there, there's such generosity in the script towards all the characters. I, That's right. They're all three-dimensional. The yeah. drama teacher isn't just a drama teacher. Sure. Yeah, and not only that, he gets that scene yeah. with your character, which I yeah. think, you know, if you had run the script through a save the cat filter or something, that scene is cut because you don't, exactly. quote unquote, need it. Mm-hmm. But it gives such depth to your character, both to both of them, and to the sense that this is a living world yeah. with concerns other than it's sometimes myopic main characters. That's right. Yeah, uh, the details that are in the script, I mean, I think that's part of its universal appeal is its specificity. And the, the even the music cues, which I think we've had a lot of fun talking about, you know, between the two of us, but they actually wind up becoming thematic touchstones throughout the, the movie that need to come back. They're not just like, oh, isn't it cool if we put this song from that era on at the time? Um, you know, one of the things I think that we were wondering is is just sort of what what's Greta like on set as a oh, director? She was fantastic. Um, as Tracy Letts says, you would never know that it was Greta's first solo directing mm-hmm. job. Mm-hmm. Um, she is very open to collaborating. Um, she is – it's a playful set. It's a, it has a sense of lightness. Um, she's very trusting that everybody that she has put in there as, – has hired to do their jobs will, will do their jobs, know how to do their jobs and will do them well. So um, it, I, I felt at the end of every working day that I left thinking, ah, oh, I think Greta thought I did a really good job today. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, it's, it was a great feeling, and it would give you the energy to want to show up at 6 a.m. the next day <laughs> and, and, and do right. another good job for Greta. It was all – it was team Greta yeah. because she um, poured herself into it 
into the script and and uh, the direction so much that everybody cast and crew wanted to support her. We've. In, any way that we could. We've learned a lot, um, as, as she's been doing press for the movie as well, about her preparation and how she gave Timothy a reading list for his character and what, mm. what might be uh, best for him. We've seen the letters she wrote to Dave Matthews and to Justin Timberlake to secure their music. The relationship between the lead character and your character is crucial. What sort of preparation did she suggest for you or what sort of rehearsal process or notes did we she give to you? We were able to get a little bit of rehearsal in, which is kind of rare. Mm-hmm. So we uh, – Sersha and I would meet sometimes with Greta or Greta would meet with us one-on-one mm-hmm. and we would just – um, plow through the script. Any questions? You know, what do you feel about this or that? And not, no major changes would come about. But I just started to learn, you know, uh, how she saw this mother. And then she was very interested. Talk about details. I mean, we were. She was interested in uh, obviously, you know, exactly what clothes mm-hmm. that we were going to be wearing and wanted our input. Um, but I would always defer to her for the final say because she just understood it in a in a way. That I didn't write off the bat. Was there a Marian detail that you added that wasn't in the script? Um, it came up sort of organically that I had a scene with one of the hospital workers. I'm leaving, and I had b- bought him a little his little, new, newborn daughter a little mm-hmm. dress, just a tiny little thing. Yeah. I think it was just sort of left open, like what would be in this package. And I knew that we shopped at the thrift store a lot and I I remember, you know, shopping for baby clothes. It's fun to, you know, look through yeah. them. So we kind of hit upon the fact that because Marion's character needs to the you know, she she can't just be the monster. Sure. And so um we hit upon the fact that um she would be really into kids. Yeah. Uh, and so that was just a little thing, touch that was added in. It's such a funny little moment of generosity of her, her character, yeah. too, because yeah, then she has to go home and kind of be the heavy against, against yeah, Lady Bird. Yeah, be the bad cop. Yeah. But um, you mentioned shopping. There's a there's a scene that I wanted to talk about specifically. It's the scene when you take Christine. I, you apologize. Marion takes Christine. Well, I call her Christine. <laughs> uh, uh, Lady Bird. <laughs> Let's say uh, Laurie and Saoirse have a scene together. Yeah. How about that? In Greta's film um, where you go dress shopping. Yeah. And when she emerges from the dressing room wearing this dress, there is a – rainbow of emotions that Marion has that passes over her face that you have to play in that moment. Uh, maybe this this is a question that veers more towards the technical side, but I'm mm-hmm. curious just as an actor how you prepare for that, all of the things going on all, all at once, and if it's a different method from being on the stage because oh. you could do second, you could do multiple takes, I guess, right. if you chose to do so. Right. But there are but there are also so many variables at play, and just you also want to be alive in the moment. Right. I'm always fascinated by those moments, but particularly one like that where it's just a masterclass because you see it all, and you don't have all the lines to express all of the emotions. Right. Yeah, it's teed up really well. You know, yeah. you're here. Here comes the daughter out of the out of the dressing room, presenting herself to her. <laughs> Very opinionated mother. Serving herself up. <laughs> it's teed yeah, up, you yeah. know, like w- for the audience, you know, what is mom going to do? Yeah. So she's going to say the wrong thing. It's, it's going to be such a letdown. But so, um, yeah, I guess I was just really, really, really trying to be in the moment mm-hmm. every time she came out the door, you know, and uh, and I ha- I I. I personally had an opinion about that dress, mm-hmm. you know, so mm-hmm. I, that that worked well for me. Okay. <laughs> I could use that. Very good. And then in the theater, you know, everything. So I guess in that, in uh, playing in that scene, I tried to stay very, very loose. Mm-hmm. In the theater, you've done three weeks of rehearsal and that scene would be, in, in to me, very crafted. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, it would be much not rigid, but it would have been already set. The touchstones of where you would be traveling, yeah. basically, yes. on an emotional, yeah. um, not a roller coaster, but an emotional journey in that yeah. moment. And so in the in the film, it's it's a little looser. Hmm. Um, I also did have to ask about um, your relationship with Tracy Letts's character. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this has been – this is probably a recurring theme in your in your press. No one can believe that you had never worked together before. Right? I was shocked. I was going to be prepared with a laundry list of all <laughs> your greatest Steppenwolf hits together. <laughs> but apparently there were none. How is no. that possible? I know. In all those years, we have never had a chance to be on stage together. But you I guys st- orbited Chicago – like, did you? Yes, it, and we've been friends for a long, long time. Yeah, but um, and and would come to see each other's work. So I knew 
I've seen Tracy enough on stage mm-hmm. and, and in film and TV that I know and, – and we have a, the Steppenwolf history. Mm-hmm. Even though we haven't shared a rehearsal room together, we have a little bit of a shorthand that way. And I knew that we shared a great sense of humor mm-hmm. and – that I've always loved his acting style, which mm-hmm. is very kind of minimalistic, you mm-hmm. know, and ve- he's the rock in the scene that your your eye keeps going to. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, what's this character think? Because he's not saying anything. And so I knew um, that I would feel comfortable in the scenes um, that we shared together. And we did. We just uh, – it was – again, it's on the page, their relationship – but we just had an ease with each other that um, is lucky and kind of rare. He's uh, a guy who obviously has had an enormous amount of acting success in the last couple of years. But I almost feel like he had to wait until he was this age to to play the evil senator. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, he like, had to grow into the look of, oh, yeah, of course you're the CIA director who's actually a traitor or something like that. And then when he met Greta <laughs> yeah. in the movie Wiener Dog that they did together, yeah. she th- thought, assumed that mm-hmm. he would be, I don't know, a little more menacing. Yeah. And when she found out that he wasn't, that's what clicked in her mind that he should play the dad. I, I love what he's able to do in the movie because he has the confidence and the experience to do very little yes. as, as you're speaking to. I mean, that it takes, I would imagine it would, t- it, that's the sort of thing that it takes an actor maybe a long time to learn that you don't have to it do does. a lot to be it there. It does. It's the simplest thing you'd think that you'd stumble on early on, but you know, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you know, to, to, to not work at it mm-hmm. is a valuable lesson. Mm-hmm. For you, for somebody who does so much different stuff in all these different mediums, is it strange to concentrate so much on this work, to go back to what you were saying in the beginning, a, a work that you did a year ago, and you, mm-hmm. you've been very busy since then on stage and on mm-hmm. television and film, and do you, do you feel comfortable going back and talking about something like this? Like, not entirely. <laughs> not entirely. <laughs> no. should, should, should we end the interview now? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's, I, I, I love the work, and I've been so um, fortunate to be able to bounce between TV and film and mm-hmm. theater. Um, but I've always had a phobia about the camera, and so I'm always a little intimidated by it. it um, so I feel much freer on the stage, and so I keep gravitating back there. So I've really only done a handful of films, yeah. and I feel like I don't have that much experience with them. So um, this was a this was a great set to be on because it was so supportive. And it's also hard when you're a supporting a character to pop in and out. Mm, sure. Mm-hmm. You really don't feel like you get much traction like you can in the run of a show, mm-hmm. of a play. Yeah. Um, so it's just a, a style of – a way of working that I'm just not used to yet. You know, the working out of sequence. Mm-hmm. Um on one day here, take three weeks off, come back for three days. It's just uh, mentally I'm I'm uh, just still learning. The Steinbeck scene in the beginning of Lady Bird, you guys shot rather late into the, into That's the right. shoot, right? Which I, I thought was actually a really interesting tidbit because you seem so familiar with each other in that scene. It, it right. actually feels like you've been stuck in a car together yeah. for a few days. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so that came at the end of the at the end of the shoot. So you, were, were, did you did you feel like that was something that really went a long way towards establishing that that tone, even if it is out yeah. of sequence I like that? I think it was helpful that that was towards the end mm. yeah. of the show. And Saoirse and I had had a lot of fights, you know, yeah. in, in, in the sh- in the I keep calling it a show. <laughs> I noticed. You see, that's good. <laughs> in the movie up till then. And um, and I, that's one of my favorite scenes. Because there's a little bit of everything in there. Yeah. There's there's the emotion, then there's the the humor, and then the anger, and then the buttons are being pushed, and then the eruption. There's you a know? Stud. And then a surprise. Yeah. Yeah. A stud, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so we got to do it three or four times, and there was I didn't have to really drive; I just had to do the fake driving or being pulled in a car. Your driving is under quite a microscope in this movie. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, I have to ask you a little bit about your TV work um, because you know. I think I can speak for, for yes. both of us. We didn't grow up in Chicago. We're both from Philly. Uh, so we did not attend Steppenwolf Theater when we were young. We were introduced to you on Roseanne sure. um, and grew up with that show and with your incredible performance on it. Um, you've done great work in TV since. And I and I want to make sure we have a moment to even mention Getting On, which is such a terrific, terrific oh, show. I love that. But specifically coming from um, an esteemed and, you know, and, and successful career on the stage 
uh, going to be on Roseanne. TV was different then. I mean, yeah. now people aspire to be on TV in a different way because there's so much depth of shows like Getting On. Mm-hmm. Um, and the writing is great. And the writing yeah. is good. And, the, and you know, so many actors and directors are working there. Mm-hmm. To go to a sitcom, I mean, Roseanne was a special sitcom, but to go to a sitcom right. the year that you did, can you talk a little bit about just the atmosphere? I was kind of scared to yeah. do it because uh, I'd only done theater, maybe one movie. And... Um, so I, I came to uh, L.A. to maybe get a movie. I, theater wasn't even on my radar. Mm-hmm. And uh, the people who cast um, Desperately Seeking Susan mm-hmm. were casting Roseanne. So they asked me in. They didn't even have the sister character written yet. So I read some lines from Roseanne. Mm-hmm. And then they were interested. And I a- eventually ended up get, being offered the part. And I said to the casting directors, uh, oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to be Urkel. You know, I, I, I don't want to be stuck. Yeah. What what happens if I get into something? I, I didn't know if it was going to be a successful show or not. It was too hard to tell. There was nothing really on the page But yet. both are scary probably on some level, <laughs> yeah. right? Yes. Because, yeah. Because if it's and successful, you're, you're there. Yes, right. And they said, Laura, you have to do this. Don't walk away from it. And so I did it and it's been – it was a wonderful nine-year – Experience. I think people see, you know, oh, you're in, you're in a television show. That must be great. But that era of network television, going up to, I mean, it's obviously people still do these. I mean, The Big Bang Theory, they shoot 22 episodes, 23 episodes a mm-hmm. year or whatever. But you know, I remember when they ended The Good Wife on CBS recently, and Juliana Margulies was just like, I just can't do this many shows like I can't be on the set this much because she's in almost every shot of that show and that's a single camera and that's a single camera mm-hmm. show Hour-long. yeah mm-hmm. yeah no the the multi-camera uh, sitcom is the cushiest job <laughs> in show business okay. yes. and a yes, little theatrical is. as well right because you have the audience well you and, do have the live yeah. audience yeah but they're, they're it's it's theatrical because the warm up guy has got them pumped <laughs> right, into right, right, right. a fever pitch <laughs> yeah. where right. they're gonna they're primed to laugh at anything no matter what yeah, but no why, matter what but, and they actually throw off the timing Oh, because they're just you know, ready to laugh. Yeah, yeah. So, but why else did you say cushy? I interrupted you. Oh, because of the schedule. Okay. Oh, really? Okay. Um, yeah, I raised two of my kids doing the Roseanne. Because it's those just nine r- to five, or it's not even nine. No, it gets, She's it blow gets the way off better it. than that. <laughs> <laughs> come in on Monday. You do the table read. You might rehearse a couple mm-hmm. hours. Go home. Okay. <laughs> Tuesday, and then they send you rewrites. You know. Uh, well, now it's by email, but mm-hmm. some PA used to have to drive around to everybody's house <laughs> and, and drop them, them at the front door. And Tuesday is a nice, uh, easy day also with maybe a rehearsal day with maybe a three o'clock run through for the writers. OK. And the run through takes 45 minutes. So that's that day. And then Wednesday <laughs> is wow. a nice, easy rehearsal day with a 2.30 run through for the network people. OK. And then you're done that day. And then Thursday is you do a little pre-shooting maybe to get sure. a couple of scenes out of the way, maybe some scenes that are too technical that you don't want to have right. to do in front of the audience. Mm-hmm. So you do hair and makeup and shoot a couple of scenes. And that. And then Friday is the long day. <laughs> <laughs> this is where it gets really grueling. <laughs> wow. But you come in like sometimes, I don't know, 11, 12, even. <laughs> Refresh we, the we scenes. We really miss the boat. We are in the wrong business. Yeah. We should have been warm up guys for Roseanne. You, you refresh the scenes. Oh, I thought you were going to say we should have been esteemed theater actors in Chicago <laughs> and then gotten hired, but I have a longer con. Yeah. But, wow. You go back over the scenes, then you go into hair and makeup, and then at like 5.15, all the actors and the director huddle in the hair and makeup room, which is kind of fun, and you speed through the lines of the whole show. Mm-hmm. It's a little glib through warm up. And then, and as you're doing that, the studio audience is being brought in, and you start the show at six, and we're basically done by nine. Wow, that's pretty good. And that's not bad. You only do, at the most, three shows in a row before taking a hiatus week. A well earned hiatus. And, well earned, mm-hmm. and you have the whole summer off. Wow, this is great. <laughs> right? Good for you yeah. and for everyone else. <laughs> nice one, Lori. Um, <laughs> all of this is also prelude to, prelude to say that you're you're doing it again. So the show yeah. ended its first run in ninety five, six, something in there. Yeah. Nine years, you said. Yes. I don't. And then suddenly, it's happening again. How, what was this like for you? Was there ever any hesitation that you would no, rejoin? No, Sarah Gilbert uh, started calling people saying, uh, "Would you like to do a reunion show, or what if we could get a small order of shows?" Mm-hmm. And everybody said yes right off the bat. And so, since the pilot. It's actually been 29 years. Wow. 
since our first pilot, which is horrifying. (laughs) Hard to imagine. (laughs) But um, we rehearsed today. We had a rehearsal for number... Is it like falling back into it? It it... is. Yeah. Do you guys have the same structure now, still Mm schedule-wise? Yeah. Just less episodes, yeah. Less episodes. How is John Goodman reacting to playing a zombie? Because <laughs> I feel like he's an actor from the stage as well. He likes yeah, a challenge. He's probably played yes. a zombie a couple of times. Possibly. It gets handled yeah, it's, in uh, episode one. It's addressed. Yeah, It, yeah. it is addressed. No spoilers, please. No. And also, I do feel that like the real Roseanne heads would be okay if it wasn't. Like, I, I'm not, I'm not going to let my enjoyment of a return engagement with the show be held up by continuity errors. I'm, I'm okay no. with it. I you think know, everybody would have been fine if we would have said, okay, let's just shave off season yeah, eight and nine. Exactly. Right, and we'll pick it up after the end do, of season seven. They do it with the comic book movies all the do time. Do you think we're going to get in trouble for spoiling the end of year nine Someone of Roseanne? Will be this is the, because one thing I've learned is that um, the younger generation, mm-hmm. um, Lady Bird generation or younger, yes. let's say, yeah. uh, watch these older sitcoms on Netflix like serialized yes. drama. Like people, high school kids watch Friends as if it is a 205 installment <laughs> yes. uh, n- great Russian novel, you know, which was not how it was intended necessarily. No. But that's Somebody how Roseanne is being digested. Somebody just The Office like it was Twin Peaks. He's like, oh, I'm, I'm midway through The Office. And I was just like, really? I can tell <laughs> you how it goes. I mean, they go to work every day, yeah. Yeah. But do you, have you, do you get into going back to rewatch any, any stuff it's from back around It's been then? more than five years. Yeah, it has. But it has. I can watch the Roseanne episodes. <laughs> okay. And, and um, sadly, I don't remember how any of them end. <laughs> 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 it's because you had too much time off. You weren't, you know, mentally you weren't committed yeah. there. Yeah. It is, can we get Clooney back? Because Clooney was Booker early he on, and Booker. I he'll always be Booker to me. I know I he know. went on to other things. Uh, yeah. And he, yeah. Did they recast Booker in the show? No. Is there, is there no. Re- there's no Booker. Okay. No. This the, this factory. We're getting deeper oh. in now. The factory stuff was the factory sort of went away stuff after a went away year. because the factory stuff never seemed to work, and we were all convinced that where the factory was placed on the soundstage mm. was over an ancient Indian burial ground. Is that true? <laughs> no. But, that, but we're, we're saying that that's the reason why n- nothing, on that ex- nothing on that part of the set ever worked. That's good. Ah, there was also the loose meat restaurant. Oh, yeah. I didn't remember the name, but we, that's, yeah. We sold loose meat sandwiches <laughs> for quite a while. That never worked. <laughs> never took off. <laughs> You'd think the show was itself cursed, but no, it was quite successful <laughs> just despite square, the just one that, square yeah, yeah. inside of it. Well, um, uh, we'll let you go, but thank you so much for stopping by, Laura thanks. Metcalf. If anybody hasn't seen Lady Bird, obviously make it a number one priority. Yes, but also watch the loose meat episodes yeah, of Roseanne. I feel like I feel in like in order, yes. in order, or else you won't be able to watch you the new one. You can't follow You'll it. You'll be lost. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Sure. Thanks, guys. Today's episode of The Watch was brought to you by Zelle. Cash is easy to lose, and checks take a while to clear. Thankfully, there's Zelle, a new way to send money to your friends and family from your banking app. Once you've enrolled, the money moves right between almost any U.S. bank accounts and typically arrives in minutes. Plus, it's backed by major banks, which means you can send money confidently. Just go to zellepay.com, that's Z-E-L-L-E-P-A-Y.com, to learn more. Zelle, this is how money moves.